Amen. Please be seated. Blessed are all that on him stay. It has a different feel when you sing those words to that tune, uh, but it is uh, God's word that we sing, so that is, that is good. Well, this morning uh, we continue our series on uh, the, our Advent series on the supremacy of Christ in song. And uh, as we're, we're looking at uh, different songs in Scripture that talk about the person and work of Christ. And last week, uh, we started that study by looking at Hebrews chapter 1, the first uh, four. Well, actually, we looked at the entire first chapter of Hebrews, but we focused on uh, verses 1 through 4, uh, which... Uh, may have been, may be, a portion of an early uh, Christian church hymn, although we don't know uh, for certain if that is the case, but it, it has uh, the marks of, of being so. We talked about that uh, last week, week but, but Hebrews chapter 1 uh, serves as our launching point into our study of the songs of Christ in Scripture. And the reason for that is that in Hebrews chapter 1, we find seven psalms that are uh, at least referenced uh, in that chapter. Technically, I suppose there's five direct quotations of the psalms uh, and two quotations of other New Test or Old Testament texts that seem also, though, to allude uh, to uh, the psalms. Uh, whatever the case, the, the first chapter of Hebrews... Uh, shows us that the author's intent was to use the Old Testament to show uh, the supremacy of Christ in all things. In fact, uh, we would say the entire book of Hebrews is really written for that purpose, to show that, that Jesus is uh, the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament promised. You know, that, that, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, that he's the the good and faithful high priest who offered himself, right, as the, the eternal Lamb of God, the, the once for all sacrifice for sin, the, the only mediator, the scripture says, between God and man, the only one through whom true worship of God can take place. And, and Hebrews 1 sets the tone for that emphasis throughout the book of Hebrews and 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 he does so the author of Hebrews does this by sort of it's sort of a rapid fire uh, quotation or, or he seems to quote the Psalms in rapid fire one after the other to showing that that Jesus is the one who was spoken about in the Old Testament that he was the promised Messiah that he is the one who's superior to all things even the angels. And so that's why this morning we are going to look at this first psalm that is quoted, not Psalm 1, but Psalm chapter 2. Uh, as the, the book of Hebrews, uh, this in chapter 1, verse 5, actually, Hebrews 1, 5, uh, the author of Hebrews quotes Psalm chapter 2 to show the supremacy of of Christ, And so we're going to read Psalm chapter 2, which of course we just sung, but we'll read it as well. Uh, so if you would turn with me there, uh, this is the word of the Lord. Why do the heathen nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. 
Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Well, this is the word of our God. Thanks be to God for his holy and inerrant word. Well, Psalm 2 is one of the most often quoted psalms in the New Testament. It is, of course, a messianic psalm, uh, and it is quoted quite a few times, or at least alluded to uh, in the New Testament quite a few times. Of course, we see, all right, in Hebrews 1, 5, it's quoted there. Uh, later in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 5, verse 5, it's quoted. Uh, in Acts 4, it's quoted, Acts 13, and we'll look at those two passages uh, later. Uh, probably, also, it's alluded to in Matthew chapter 3 at Jesus' baptism. Uh, the transfiguration in Matthew 17, uh, as well as uh, passages in Revelation chapter 2 and 19. All of these, of course, pointing to the fact that, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Messianic King. Now, in the original context of Psalm chapter 2, uh, it, it may well have been a coronation psalm. In other words, uh, it was a, a psalm that the king of Israel, when he ascended to the throne, would have uh, said these words from Psalm chapter 2, or at least part of them. Or they may have been read as part of the ceremony uh, to install him as king. And of course the reason for that was to remind him of who he was, or at least the, the position that God had given him, to, to remind him of his role as the Davidic king, right? The king that had been promised to David back in 2 Samuel chapter 7. There's a, a strong connection between Psalm chapter 2 and 2 Kings chapter 7. Of course, 2 Kings 7 is that, uh, that key passage in Old Testament, in, in redemptive history, uh, when God renewed his covenant with David. And in 2, King, or 2 Samuel 7, God says to David, he promises him, he says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Now, of course, the, the original referent of this promise was Solomon, right? David's uh, the first son of David who ascended to the throne after David, um, but it was not only to Solomon, right? We see the, the reference to the establishment of the throne forever, uh, but the, and, and ultimately, of course, it speaks of Christ, but it also spoke uh, to those kings who followed after Solomon prior to Christ as well in a, in a lesser sense, right? It was, it was passed on uh, to every king that ascended to the throne of David. And it was a, a reminder that he had been given a privileged position with respect to God's people. He had a, a special relationship, as it were, as the son, small s, of God. Now there were some kings, right, if we, we're not going to do a, a, an exhaustive review of Old Testament history, or particularly the history of the monarchy, but of course there were some kings who filled this role uh, better than others. Uh, but the point is that the, the, that the king of Israel, or the king of Judah actually, after the split between the northern and the southern kingdoms, uh, the Davidic king had a privileged position. He had a, a, a special role with respect to God's people to serve as their representative ruler to serve as God's representative ruler over his people on earth and Psalm 2 was 
a reminder. It was a, a charge, if you will, to the newly anointed king to tell him, to remind him of his status and responsibility before God. And like I said, I'm not going to spend time talking about or reviewing redemptive history or even really talking about the responsibilities that had been given to the Davidic king. For our purposes, we, we simply need to understand this, and that is that in Jesus, we see the Davidic king par excellence. The, the, the ruler who ruled perfectly, or rules perfectly, right? That he is the one who, who per perfectly fulfills the role and the responsibilities of the Davidic king. He is the, the true son of God, the rightful ruler of God's people. That was certainly the, the emphasis of the New Testament authors as, as they quote this psalm uh, throughout. And, and of course, that is what we will see this morning as we take a, a deeper look at Psalm chapter 2, that Jesus is the Davidic king above all. And so this morning we're going to look at Psalm 2, and we're going to look at it in four parts, and these will serve sort of as our, our four points. One uh, the, the rebellion of men's hearts. Secondly, God's sovereign rule. Thirdly, God's covenantal decree. And fourthly, the submission of men's hearts. Uh, verses 1 through 3, we see here the, the rebellion of men's hearts. The rebellion of the nations. We, 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 hear, we see here the, the attitude of that the nations have toward God and his anointed ruler. And the language that we, we read here in these first three verses, it says they, they, they rage against God, that the nations plot and conspire against him, that they take counsel together and set themselves against God and his rule over them. And of course, we see this opposition of the, of the nations, of the, of the world toward God throughout Scripture. Psalm 46, Psalm 83. Uh, the prophets, of course, spoke of that, that uh, once future day when the nations would, would gather together against the Lord and His anointed. Uh, Zechariah 12 would be an example of that. Uh, the book of Revelation. Right? speaks of that, that future day when all the kings of the earth would gather together to oppose Christ on the last day. Revelation 19, for example. But of course, when we talk about the rebellion of men's hearts, we don't really need to, to look exclusively at these cataclysmic examples that we find in scripture to understand the, the rebelliousness of men's hearts that exists and is described in verses 1 through 3 of Psalm 2. Rather, we understand the rebellion of men's hearts both intellectually and experientially in that the attitude that we find described in verses 1 through 3 is the attitude that we find in all men's hearts, even our own. Now, it's easy to, to sort of read this passage and to get caught up in, in all of the, you know, the eschatological developments and the nations opposing God and the last battle and, and all of those things. But we need when we read this passage, to, to see our own identification with the attitude of the nations that is described here, our own sin and opposition to God. Because beginning in Genesis 3 with the fall, when, when man desired to be like God, 
in Genesis 6, right? When, when we read that the intention of man's heart, his thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. When we read in the, the time of the judges that everyone did what was right in his own eyes, we understand that that is descriptive of our own hearts as well, our own heart condition. Because man continue, we continually show our desire to be autonomous beings, to be, as, as that word means, a law unto ourselves, right? To, to answer to no one but ourselves, right? That, that we desire to be in control. We desire to call our own shots, to do what we want to do when we want to do it. And when things happen differently than we think they ought, we, we rage against God. We say, Lord, what are you thinking? Why are you doing it that way? That's not part of my plan. God, if you would only do it the way I want to do it, then everything would turn out okay. Or at least the way I want it to turn out. <laughs> right? We've all been there. We know our hearts. We know our thoughts. But God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And God, brothers and sisters, does far more abundantly than we could ever ask or imagine. Why? Because he does these things according to his plan and his purpose. Now it's interesting as we, as we look at Psalm chapter 2, that Psalm 2 is cited in Acts chapter 4. And the, it is applied to the circumstances that led to Jesus' crucifixion, beginning in Acts 4.23. It says this, that when they, John and Peter, uh, were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Verse 27, For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Interesting, right? In, in, in describing the events that led to Jesus' description, the, 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 how, how God used the, the opposition, and he doesn't leave anybody out here, does he? <laughs> in this description, right? The Gentiles, the Israelites, Pontius Pilate, so on and so forth. They were all part of this, right? They were all part. They, they all had a, an opposition toward Christ, a rebellion against the Son of God. But that opposition, that rebellion was part of God's eternal plan and purpose. In other words, right, we see how these things fit together, how God uses the evil acts of men to accomplish his good and perfect purposes. Certainly, we're familiar with the evil acts of men, right? If, if uh, Unless you've been hiding under a rock. You know what happened this past week in, in Paris. And, uh, right, you know what's going on around the world, right? We see the, 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 the evil acts of men in front of us, right? We can't avoid it. But we have to understand that God is in control of these things. 
that indeed the nations plot in vain and the, the nations rebel against God, but their rebellion is ultimately futile. Why? Because God is the rightful ruler of all creation. And God will carry out his plan according to his good purpose. And of course, that is our, our second point this morning, a second part of our text. And that is the sovereign rule of God that is described here in verses 4 through 6. And it, it's interesting, the description that we find of God in verse 4. It says that he, he laughs at the rebellion of the nations. He, he holds them in derision. The idea is that he is he's amused by their actions. And of course, we, we understand, right, this is a, an anthropomorphism, right, a, a, a describing God using human terms, right, that, that uh, it's, it's the best we can do to describe um, God's posture toward uh, the events that are going on, a human description of emotion ascribed to God. But the point of it is clear enough, right? That the, that the kings of the earth are foolish to think that they can actually change God's course of action with respect to the establishment and the progress of his kingdom and his redemptive plan in human history. And this, brothers and sisters, should be a tremendous source of comfort to us. Right? Especially when we consider the events, and they could be major world events, personal events that are going on. Right? That, that in a world in which we, we hear of, of terrorist attacks in an exponentially increasing rate, it seems, at times. When we hear of, of Christians being persecuted at an alarming rate around the world, we must remember who God is and what he is doing. That God's plan cannot be thwarted. And even though the nations may rage, even though the, the kings of the earth may set themselves against God and even mock those who would proclaim God's sovereign rule, God is still in control. Daniel 2, 21 says that God changes times and seasons, that God removes kings and sets up kings. God gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. God is in control of these things. Or 2 Chronicles 26 that says, Of God, you rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. That is the God that we serve. That is the God that we worship. And so take heart, dear Christians. That God is seated on his throne. That God is working in men's hearts to accomplish his purposes in the world. And, and so even though, right, it, it may feel from time to time, or all the time, <laughs> like things are, are spiraling out of control. Know that God is working all things together for his plan and his eternal purpose and ultimately for our good through the gathering of the nations to himself. And he's doing that through the carrying out of his covenantal decree, which we see described here in verses 7 through 9, our third point this morning. Much of the, the significance of this passage here in, in uh, Psalm chapter 2, in verses 7 through 9, much of it centers on these verses, and, and particularly the statement in verse 7. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. 
And as I, as I mentioned earlier, right, in, in its original context, this st is a statement that was applied, most likely, to the, the king of Israel upon his co coronation. And it was applied in, in accordance with God's promise to David back in 2 Samuel 7, right, that David's offspring, that the David's offspring's kingdom would be established forever and that God would be a father to him and that he would be God's son. And this, of course, was the renewal of God's covenant with David in 2 Samuel 7. But as we discussed, the kings of Israel, the, the, the succession of kings that, that followed David and Solomon and so on, that these were sons of God in a, in a very limited sense. But they pointed us ultimately to the true Davidic king, the, the, the messianic king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, the, the King David's, great King David's greater son. And throughout the New Testament, we see the statement, You are my son, today I have begotten you, applied repeatedly to Jesus. But the question we might ask ourselves is, when did Jesus become the Son of God? Isn't he the eternal Son of God? What does it mean when he says, today I have begotten you? Good question. <laughs> right? Well, we know this. Let us be clear about this. That, that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. To, to use the language of the Nicene Creed, which we uh, confess from time to time, he is the only begotten Son of God. Begotten, not made being of one substance with the Father, that, that Jesus has eternally existed as the only begotten Son of God. There has never been a time when the second person of the Trinity did not exist. There has never been a time when the, the first and second persons of the Trinity did not exist in a Father-Son relationship. And so we need to understand, begotten in this sense is not used as we often do as as generating from okay that the son was not brought into existence by the father he has eternally existed as the only begotten son of god so what does it mean when we hear the statement you are my son today i have begotten you how can that be applied to jesus the second person of the trinity and the answer is, in a very similar fashion to the way in which it was applied to the Davidic king when he ascended to the throne, but of course in a much fuller and greater sense. Listen to the words of Paul in Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 28. And it says, And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem and are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that God, that what God promised to the fathers, verse 33, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, today, or you are my son, today I have begotten you. In other words, through the completion of his redemptive work, through the resurrection from the dead, and his ascension to the right hand of the Father, Jesus has taken his seat on the Davidic throne. He is the true Son of God, the true Messianic King, the one whom the prophets promised, the rightful ruler and King of all creation, 
the one to whom David and all of his descendants pointed. He is the one who is worthy of our worship. He is the one who is worthy of our service and adoration. Indeed, he is the true king, the one to whom the nations have been given as an inheritance, as verse 8 says. But perhaps you wonder, wait, how, how, is, how can we say that Jesus is ruling now? How can we say that, that Jesus is seated on the throne now when there's so much wrong in the world? And the answer is simply this, that while Jesus has come, and has established his, his kingdom. His kingdom has not yet come in all its fullness. Right? The, his current rule is primarily a spiritual one in which he, he rules and reigns in the lives and hearts of his people by the power of his word and spirit. But he is reigning. And one day, he will rule, to use the language of this psalm, with an iron scepter. Right? This is the, the, the already not yet tension that, that we sometimes talk about that, that characterizes the time between Jesus' first and, and second coming. Because the, the kingdom has come in Christ, but has not come yet in all of its glory. Jesus has defeated his enemies, but he has not yet put them fully and finally to death. But on the last day, he will. He will carry out what we see pictured actually right here in verse 9. He said, when it says, he will break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. This is the section of the psalm that, that Revelation picks up on, both in, in chapter 2 and, and verse 19, speaking of the, the final defeat of God's enemies on the last day. And, and we do, we look expectantly to that day, not because of all of our enemies being crushed, right, but because it is that day when we will enter glory and we will be with our Savior forever in the eternal kingdom. But in the meantime, brothers and sisters, we live in, in, in what we call the in-between time. The time between Christ's first and second coming, when, when the reality of evil continues to exist and even grow. And Christ's rule and reign is, is actually opposed. But what ultimately, and, 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 and importantly, what characterizes also this time between is what we see here in our fourth section. And that is the, the gathering of the nations. The submission of the nations, of men's hearts. You see, up to this point in this psalm, the nations have been described as enemies of God. Those who oppose God and his rule, the rule of his anointed Messiah. But then in verse 10, we have what, what amounts to an appeal for those same enemies. To come and to serve the Lord, to kiss the Son, is the language of verse 9. To, to bow the knee to Jesus, to take refuge in him. We say, wait a minute. What's going on? Why is God showing mercy to these enemies who raged and plotted against him and rejected him? Isn't that the gospel? Is that not what God has done for you and me? As Romans 5.10 says that while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. 
Colossians 1, 21 to 22, you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of the flesh by his death. You see, brothers and sisters, that is the gospel by which we live. That God came to us when we were still enemies and gave us a privileged status as his sons and daughters. He gave us a, a privileged place as co-heirs with his only son, Jesus Christ. And he has seated us with Christ in the heavenly places and has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. But not only has he given us a privileged status and a, and a privileged place, but he gives us the privilege to be his instruments in calling the nations into submission to Christ. Declaring that that simple but glorious message that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe that this morning? If not, then I appeal to come to Jesus this morning. <laughs> believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God who takes away the sin of the world. Kiss the Son as the psalm says. And serve the Lord with gladness, knowing that we are blessed if we take refuge in him. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we give you thanks and praise this morning for your glorious plan, which you have worked out in, in history, that you would... O oh Lord, send your only Son, the eternal Son of God, to take on flesh, to be born as a baby, and to grow to be a man, a faithful and obedient man, even unto death. Paying the penalty, O oh Lord, for our sin that we deserved, and giving us your righteousness that we might stand before you, our Father, that we might have right standing through faith in Jesus Christ. Help us, O oh Lord, to, to delight in the Son of your love this morning, that we, O oh Lord, might enjoy the benefits of being your adopted sons and daughters in Christ. Be with us. Glorify yourself in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.